Welcome to the Small Business Success Tips Podcast with me, your host, Neil McDonald. I've dedicated myself to your success in federal government contracting and host these podcast episodes as a way to provide key information and tips that will help small businesses like yours learn how to more effectively sell your services to federal buyers. Government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. In each episode, our guest shares their knowledge and experience with you, helping you learn a bit more about the process. While they will have different titles, their common goal is to help the federal government benefit from what small businesses offer. Each guest donates their time because they realize not everyone has the budget or time to meet them in person, and I absolutely thank them for that. Our guest today is Sam Green, and excuse me, Sam, sorry, it's Sam Reen, just to make sure I say that correctly. Um, when he and I got introduced, I knew you'd thank me for introducing him to you because he just has a lot to share. He brings experience from both industry and government, and I'm hoping lessons learned from both as well. Sam's a contracting officer in the U.S. Air Force's Cryptologic and Cyber Systems Division over at Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland in Texas. In this role, which he's in until just mid-August, he oversaw the Air Force's largest portfolio of highly classified offensive and defensive cyber uh, weapon programs, including addressing artificial intelligence or AI, big data, and the quantum computing needs of the Air Force. And that was just the last couple of years. Another area of interest to many of you listening relates to agile DevOps and risk management framework both of which Sam was tasked with implementing and integrating across the Air Force. Before that, he was supporting AFSOC, or Air Force Special Operations Command, in various contracting positions around the country and while deployed in Afghanistan. There's a lot to Sam's bio that you can do your own research on, and that will absolutely impress you. But one more thing I wanted to point out is the Startup Club out of San Antonio, Texas. Sam founded this organization and podcast to communicate with San Antonio businesses how to start and succeed in business. Definitely check it out, whether you're in Texas or not. You can find the link in the show notes, but if you're in a hurry, that website address is thestartupclub.org. Welcome, Sam, and thank you for joining us today. As you know, I like starting each episode off with the same question to help listeners know a bit more about you before we get started. From a very high level, what do you do, and what do you like about what you do? Hey, Neil. Uh, thanks for having me on, and I appreciate that introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm a contracting officer with the Cyber Systems Division, like you said, and so I'm helping program managers and uh, really all cross-function teams, so that's data scientists, software engineers, you know, the Air Force users, and I'm helping them uh, go out and interact with business to get the requirements that we have, what, you know, whatever the Air Force needs. I'm uh, I'm the guy that goes out and negotiates, works with small businesses and large uh, to basically procure um, things for our programs. And so uh, what I really love is I like to be on the cutting edge. We're constantly looking for the next big thing and, uh, you know, and, and integrating that with uh, within the Air Force technology. So it's cool to see and it's a lot of fun. No, that's awesome. And and I know there's a lot of stuff that we're not going to talk about. So those of you who are looking for the deep secrets of um, AFSOC, that's not happening on this podcast, right? That's on some other podcast. But for us, we're going to talk about um, some of the things, even just what you just said there, Sam, uh, about helping program managers and other stakeholders um, interact and get access to um, industry. Can you share a little bit? Because uh, for a lot of us small businesses, we're subject matter experts on technology or whatever we sell, and we always think to ourselves, if we could just get access to the program office, if they just knew what we sold or if we could talk to them about some of our experience, they would buy what we buy. What is some of the earliest stages that you and um, your colleagues around uh, your organization, when do you begin to start reaching out and and how can, and maybe this is a bigger question right here, but how can we small businesses be visible when you start looking? How do we get in front of your eyes? Sure. So, you know, first I'll dispel, I guess, the notion that, you know, a lot of the the classified stuff is for large businesses only. And, and that's not true. Like when whenever we're dealing with, um, you know, high technology, a lot of the those you know, Apple's of the world and Microsoft and Google's and stuff, they started in a garage. 
And that's when we want to capture the technology is when it's brand new and fresh and we want to get it in. And it's so most often the really cool stuff comes from small businesses. So we love to work with them and uh, we're always on the lookout for new things. And uh, probably the best way is to get in front of us is, is not actually like contacting the contracting officer. I know, um, you know, anytime we make an award or something like that, we have a public notice, the contracting officer's name is on there. So people reach out to me and my colleagues all the time. But, uh, you, you know, we're not real, we're not the people you want to be talking to because we know the federal acquisition regulation, like the back of our hand, but when you're talking about Kubernetes and software and stuff, a lot of that goes right over our head. So, you know, it's a lot of contracting officers can't, we can't spell AI. So, um, okay. but we're going to help, help uh, the program manager get stuff on contract. So it's actually the program managers that you need to be getting in front of. And uh, they're going to be the ones that know the requirements and they're going to bring you to us uh, to work with and say, okay, this is the stuff I want. Um, help me get it on contract, and then that's kind of when we come into play. So getting in front of program managers is not that difficult. Um, there's no, you know, secret meetings or anything like that. Uh, two of the biggest ways are small business innovation uh, and research, SBIR program, um, as a CSOs, as commercial solution offerings, and then uh, just conventions and, honestly, like career days and hiring days. Like those are all opportunities to meet program managers within the Air Force, find out, like, hey, you know, what kind of stuff do you work on and how can I help you? And that's when the kind of the connections are made. And then, you know, they'll explore, okay, that sounds interesting. Let me find out more about that. You'll have a conversation and then they ultimately know that, okay, I've got this requirement coming up. I've talked to these number of small businesses that say they can do this. I'll bring that list to the contracting officer. Hey, go out and, you know, send an RFP to these people, that kind of thing. So, No, that's perfect. And, and I've got several, I think, questions that just all go rapidly within there. Uh, one is just off the bat, because you're right, we, we get out there, we go to FBO or wherever, and we go, oh, hey, look, there's Sam. <laughs> you know, we, we call you up. Now, one of the things I try to teach is that Sam doesn't know AI, but he knows contracting, but is – are the KOs or the COs, are they the path to trying to get the name of a program um, program officer or program office uh, key points of contact? I guess I'll just pause with that question for a second. Yeah, so, you know, it's uh, out there, public information. You can start from the high level. So if it's, uh, say, you've got a business software, you know, so you want to start at, okay, what, what program, large program offices, PEO as they call them, it's like program executive offices, would my software fall under? And then you might look at, okay, there's PEO Digital, PEO c 3 i and uh, I think that's Networks. The <laughs> It escapes me the actual full spelled out. But And then there's, uh, you know, there's business systems. And so say, okay, um, yeah, I want to talk to someone in business systems. So you start maybe searching on LinkedIn uh, for Air Force business systems programs, you know, and then you're going to you're gonna ping up uh, any number of people. They might be engineers. They might be, you know, d- data specialists or they might be the program manager. Uh, but searching through there is a good way to, you know, find somebody who can connect you uh, to, the, to the specific program you're looking for. No, that's perfect. And, um, and I think that's a, a challenge that uh, we're, I'm personally trying to figure out how to, how to teach people, you know, put out some free course or something that teaches people how to go from zero to traction within the Air Force, for example. Um, you know, say you want to f- find uh, the main office that's responsible for SharePoint or Office 365. When I was in, I just knew it because I knew people in that, and I would bounce around. But if you're completely out of an agency, um, how do you find it? It sounds like your, you know, your initial one is just starting at that high, high command level or um, PEOs. Yeah, and then drill down. Well, I mean, it you can Google, uh, like I said, if if you're looking for SharePoint, I would Google Air Force SharePoint and just click over to the news, and then you're probably going to find some sort of Air Force publication. Whether it's, you know, every Air Force base has a public affairs office, so. Um, Sometimes those public affairs offices will write articles about what the organizations on base are doing, what they're up to. 
So if you search Air Force SharePoint, I don't have a computer in front of me, but if you did that, you might find, uh, you know, a new story that, hey, such and such program office um, updated SharePoint or this and whatnot. And then there may even be some contacts, you know, POC information right there in the article. Uh, but at least you, you've got a place to start. Say, okay, I, I know what base it's at. I know what the acronym that it falls under. Maybe it's Air Force Lifecycle Management Center, AFLCMC. You know, all those little bits of information can kind of help you connect the dots. But uh, your program officer or program manager, excuse me, he's going to know everybody. You know, he's got – he works with the engineers. He works with the contracting, the finance, the legal team. And everybody is kind of plugged into the program manager so or at least knows who's in that seat. So even if you can get someone on the periphery, they're going to know who to point you to. No, that's perfect. No, I appreciate that. That was really, really good tip. We write blog posts after the podcast, and I can already see how that's going to look. Um, even that, I love talking with people because I have tons of experience, and I say this all the time. We learn something new every time we talk to somebody new. Uh, I hadn't even bothered using the news part of Google, and when we're done this, and and even I hang up, I'm gonna go back to uh, Google and start looking around and seeing that process. A uh, great tip. I appreciate that one. Um, I wanted one more question on something you had said earlier. Um, you had said something about one of the ways you might be able to find uh, key contacts, for example, at the Air Force, is career days or hiring days, and that seemed a little uh, interesting and different. Can you expand on that? Like, are you thinking I just can show up to a, a career day and maybe meet the hiring managers, even though I'm not trying to go in the Air Force? Sure. So they they need to be like – you know, military, I, I wouldn't just say like, oh, Amazon's having a career day. Let's go to that. And you're probably not going to meet anybody from the Air Force. But there's different like, so Clear Network, I think, has one, uh, clearancejobs.com. Um, they, they like to, you know, have little career days all over the country. And, uh, you know, there's some for officers, like prior military officers. There's veterans uh, career days and stuff like that. If you're showing up to those career days, a lot of times there's going to be probably a booth there that's actually stood up by, you know, the government uh, program office that's wanting to hire those veterans or those people with clearances. They're going to want to hire them to come work at their office. So that's a great place to meet uh, a hiring or, you know, a decision maker right there is usually somebody's supervisor is there a man in the booth and they've got jobs to fill, but they're also going to know everyone in the organization or at least have the ability to search, you know, in email, uh, they can, uh, it's called, uh, the, you know, the global, the global address list. Yeah. That person is going to be like, yeah, I know who, who works uh, in a couple of doors down from me. They're going to be able to search it and find the name for you right there. So, yeah, that's kind of a backdoor way of doing it. I know a lot of people will say like, you know, every program office, every contracting shop has a small business specialist and they do, and you can get, get connected to them through the SBA, and that's a great way of, of making contact. But sometimes there's kind of like a valley of death there where you, you meet this small business specialist, and they add you to their massive Rolodex of companies. But if you really want to like, okay, I got, I got my name in with this small business specialist, but now I really need to get to the, to the requirements guys, like the program managers – you know, you, you're going to need to cross that gap. And sometimes the communication is just not there between the specialist and the program manager. In some worlds they are. He's in there saying, hey, who do you got for this? Who do you got for that? But most often he's got enough people in his own Rolodex that he doesn't need to consult with a small business specialist. So, you know, you got to look for other ways of getting uh, direct to that program manager. And, and a hiring event is uh, one of those ways. No, Sam, that that one tip alone, I mean, I'm still going to get more tips out of you today, but that one tip alone makes this entire podcast worth it. I can see many, many people who would listen to this writing that down because um, it's – you're right. It is such a simple tip, but it's such a convenient place not to um, – you know, you're not really interfering with anybody, but they uh, – you know, the ability to possibly find po program offices – Thanks. That is, it is such a great tip that I'm going to try it from my own perspective because I like getting into program offices to find people to do podcasts, for example. Um, I might try it myself just to be able to write a podcast on your tip and go find other guests. So uh, I'll get back well, to you on that. <laughs> great, great. 
So, hey, let me let me switch a little bit because I want to ask you a couple of questions just about contracting in general tips. And then um, but I did want to also make time because you've got um, uh, out of San Antonio with the startup club. You've got that started. Can you and I look in there and it's it's uh, business tips. It's awesome information that you're sharing with folks on how to be successful. And actually, I thought it was really some of that stuff was really no offense, but very insightful for a, a government person to see industry, because often I feel like <laughs> government doesn't get industry, but you clearly do. How did you get into that? And what are you hoping to do with that? Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, I, you know, I, I have entrepreneurs throughout my whole family, my dad, grandparents, uncles, cousins, brothers, everybody started their own small business. I was the oddball and went military. Um, but even when I went military, I got, you know, business degrees and wanted to get into contracting and kind of be on the, on the business side of things. And, uh, it's always just fascinated me. So I wanted to put my MBA to good use and, uh, started a a 501c3 nonprofit here in San Antonio called the startup club, uh, just as a way to educate, um, entrepreneurs and small business owners. Cause like, I, I truly believe that they're going, that small business is going to be, you know, what, what helps the defense industry stay on the cutting edge, stay on the forefront and make sure that we're not disrupted in the next war. Um, I hate to say it, but you know, the bigs make big weapons, um, but they're also, you know, they get old, they're big companies. They, but, and they kind of have their way of doing things. And so they, they're not as innovative as a lot of small businesses are. Um, and so if we're not careful, you know, our, our technology, uh, there's, it's like any big business that becomes, you know, a Walmart or a massive company, they have a small business come in and disrupt their, their industry. Like with Walmart, you got Amazon or, you know, any box store is now threatened by Amazon and cause they came in with online shopping and disrupted the industry. Same thing can be done to the defense industry. So I think it's very important to keep small businesses uh, educated and, and make sure the entrepreneurs know how to work with the government. And uh, that's just one of my ways of, of doing that. Is, is so I, th- I saw a need here in uh, San Antonio for that kind of education. And so that's, that's uh, what spurred it on. It was me and a couple other captains uh, also that worked in, in the same program office I do. And we uh, started up, started the podcast and we've had a lot of fun with it. We've got uh, about a thousand or so members of the startup club and it's free to join and, and lots of free resources on there. So, definitely uh check it out no that's awesome yeah we'll we'll have links in there but i i was looking at the information it's really um, valuable you'll see me repost some of it or you know share it and drive people back there cool appreciate that so let me um let me ask you some questions about just acquisition right we talked a little bit about um the the program side and maybe getting interaction but you know from a success tips standpoint i'm always trying to help small businesses understand that really government contracting is just a process. And as long, as soon as you learn the process, you'll begin to succeed. Um, when, when you look at your experience in the air force and, um, who's doing it right, maybe who's not doing it in a way that you'd recommend they repeat. Um, I want to talk about some of the lessons learned there. So, um, just taking the, the companies or the contractors, whether they're large or small, doesn't really matter to me, but when they're coming in and they're doing it right, what's a couple of examples that, you can share with us on good behavior during, and, and to me, I think the big part I want to stay with is maybe during the RFI source of sought phase and during the RFP phase, um, and, and not just about the execution of an award, but you know, good behavior in trying to win. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you were saying, good, uh, good examples, bad examples, uh, what could just popped into my mind is, you know, we, it, it it's pretty easy to go out and find a company that will write a proposal for you and will, uh, are pretty good at writing, um, government proposals is, you know, it's usually a retired contracting officer somewhere <laughs> that knows how to write. And that's great. We see a lot of that, like really professional p- proposal come in, but then they don't follow through on the back end. They have no way of like we've awarded the companies cause their proposal looks great only to find out 30 days later, they don't know how to get paid. They, they hired the guy to write the proposal, but they don't have any understanding of, you know, wide area workflow and how to make sure that you can invoice the government and get paid. They just 
think that they can send an email and say, okay, I did my job, I'm ready to get paid now. How's that work? And so, and, and even the people that, okay, have wide area workflow accounts, you know, it's not the easiest system to, to work with, and there's other payment systems too. I know Air Force uses WAF, but there's other agencies use other things. But um, be familiar with your payment uh, system for whatever agency you're working with because, you, you know, you can mess it up and you can – and it, it wastes everybody t- everybody's time. Like the program manager has to get involved, contracting officer. Sometimes the uh, – you know, depending on the size of the contract, you might have the defense contract management agency, DCMA, get involved. Audit agency might get involved. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it can go all the way up if, if you don't have that invoice right. And most importantly, you're not going to get paid in time if you don't do it right, you know. So – I've I've had a lot of companies tell me like oh I'm never doing business with the government again because it took them six months to pay me. Um, well, you know if if that were the case, we'd have to pay interest. That's part of the FAR is that we would have to pay you interest if we were that late. But more often it's the contractor's fault for not knowing how to invoice, not knowing how to invoice correctly, and so to make sure that they can get paid within that 30 days. So. I'd, I'd say, like, you know, if, yes, it's a great thing to, to be able to propose and, and and win the contract, but make sure you can follow through and, you know, you know you got an expert that, that knows how to manage the contract uh, as well on the back end uh, post-award. No, that, that makes sense. I, um, I use numbers that people can debate, but they generally don't debate the overall idea of what I say when I say that um, – I believe new small businesses in the government space should be subcontracting for the first two to $5 million to generate the revenue, to start growing, to learn the lessons from, you know, another small uh, prime who's five to 20 million, let's say, who can teach you about um, uh, the WAPs that you talk about or other things like how to get a security clearance, how to get on base, all these things that a lot of us just take for granted. Um, I try to encourage people to do, that and that's where they begin to avoid these mistakes is if they learn from a mentor, you know, unofficial mentor, but just somebody who can guide them through the process. Um, what about in in source of salt? One of the things that we try to push, um, the reality is I am heading changing the, the organization's name to GovCon Chamber of Commerce because everything I do just helps all smalls. Um, originally, when I got started, I just wanted to solve the hub zone problem that existed, um, but in there when we were working on the hub zone program and trying to solve this issue of you know lack of hub zones hitting their goals federally um we we set up set aside calls that try to teach companies how to push an opportunity to be set aside for them hub zone and basically what i said to them was the rule of two is another one of those myths um it, it you in your head you should think rule of 10 10 of you should show up market research and all 10 of you should be able to win it and then maybe you'll have a good shot at it being set aside. But if you're the only one showing up, then it's hard for anybody on the government side to really justify setting it aside to hub zone or veteran or whatever. Um, how, how do you, what do you experience in best practices, I guess there, Sam? And then maybe what do you, what do you uh, find that people are just not doing right when we're responding to the sources sought phase? Sure. So, uh, you know, you're right. Most often, like we we put out an RFI, we try to get information to, to you know see uh, what's out there and available. But from what I I don't see, I think you hit it on the head. I, I don't see what we do set aside specifically to the breakdown. So we'll, we might set aside something 100% to small business, but then you know that's as far as we'll go. And if we award to a woman-owned or if we award to a hub zone, awesome. That's great. That can count towards our metrics, but um, I I rarely see something, um, at least on on a systems side, like a large program office. I don't I don't usually see them say, um, let's set this aside to only women owned or only disabled small business or or veteran owned or something like that. So, um, but it's something you know that can be done and should be done, uh, but. It, because we don't get the information we need through RFIs and stuff, it's just like we don't know if we have uh, the numbers out there to accomplish a set aside. So, and they don't want to risk the schedule of the program. Say we put it aside for all women-owned, and then we only get one proposal. 
well, then our schedule just slipped 30 to 45 days. We're in trouble. So, you know, especially if we need to spend that money before it gets pulled and, you know, sent to another program. So what they'll do instead is set it up to a small business, set aside 100%, just saying any small business can, can bid or only small business, and then uh, go from there because then they know, okay, well, I, we're, we're certain we can get the numbers if we just put it total small business. But, uh, you know, if you're answering to RFIs, and this is kind of outside of, of a contractor's control, but uh, definitely put, you know, what, what your subset is. So if you are, uh, you know, veteran-owned or disabled veteran or women-owned, you know, any of those subsets, uh, definitely put that on your cover page of your proposal and say, you know, that. Um, but there's no, it like what I mean is what what's outside of the small business ex- control is you may be the only women-owned to bid. And if that's the case, then they, they're not going to set it aside the women-owned because they're, they're not confident they can get the competition they need. So, uh, yes, put it on your propo- you know, cover sheet of your proposal. But don't be surprised if it doesn't get set aside for your subset. Um, yeah, I, be- I talk to uh, companies a lot about that because they're like, ah, oh, you know, I know a couple of us responded. It's like, no, you don't understand. There's no way for you to guarantee that the response of your competimates is what we call them, right? There's no way to, to – for you to know whether their response was seen as a technically competent response in the sources saw it. Um, we, we pushed a $200 million opportunity to HubZone, and the way we did it was have 100 firms respond to the sources saw it that were all HubZone. Um, and the challenge with HubZone firms, and, and, and I think a lot of small businesses have the same problem, is they don't quite have the machinery in place uh, to respond rapidly. And then another weakness that – we smalls sometimes have that we need to get over is uh, our core competency includes everything that Booz Allen and Lockheed Martin do together. Um, so we're, you know, if, if we focus on core competencies, then our response is very impressive. Um, and so uh, I, I see what you're talking about there. I want to, we're getting kind of close, but I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. One is because you have cyber IT acquisition officer in your, in your name. I know in the small world, cyber I hear this from small businesses a lot. They're they're either in the cyber and they're trying to break farther in, um, or uh, cyber is a, a secondary core competency of theirs, and they're trying to get into the government. Do you have any advice for? And I know this is a really broad question here, Sam, but do you have any advice for um, small businesses as they're communicating their competencies related to cyber, um, either either in your small world of ASOC or broader Air Force? Yeah, so um, there's – and we do – we buy a lot of software. So what that means is we'll buy software licenses. Um, so some, some it, sometimes that software that we need is made from a larger company, and so we'll buy a small business uh, contractor who is a licensed vendor um, who can, you know, resell that license uh, to the software. We build a lot of software in-house, so we'll have – uh, we'll, we'll hire small businesses who essentially act as like HR firms. They provide the people, um, and then we take the people and tell them, okay, this is what we need, build it uh, in in our facility sort of thing. And so um, so we build that software in-house, and then there's some times where a company will, you know, generate something really cool. They'll, they'll build a really cool piece of software that they – made specifically for defense purposes. Um, and then, so it's not a, not a licensing thing, but we just want to buy it outright. So if we're not buying a license and we're not buying uh building in house, um, then there's that kind of that third thing. So I think that's what you're talking about is if, if they have a capability um, cyber related and they want to sell that capability, I would recommend the small business innovation research uh, SBIR program. So there's several innovation organizations. There's Defense Innovation Unit, DIU. Um, there's AFWERX, that's A-F-W-E-R-X. Um, those are just two organizations that I've worked with in the past. They're kind of the, um, uh, they're the outside-facing 
part of our community, and so they're they're looking actively for cool technology. And if you have that, if you've got uh, a cyber capability, they're the best people to present that to, and then they can connect you with program offices that they know use this, because sometimes the programs that that they know, you know, no one else will will have access to. That's not something we publicly put out there. So. The small business innovation research thing just recently changed the uh, uh, SBIR program I'm talking about. It used to be a, um, you know, we put out our problem statement and then we get a whole bunch of submissions for possible solutions to the problem statement. But in the last, um, I guess, year or two, they reversed it and said, you know what, we're not going to put out a problem statement per se, We but we'll have an open call. So. We want you to submit your ideas, no matter what it is. We won't tell you what problems we have. Just, <laughs> just give us good ideas, and that's a really cool opportunity because now, you know, we don't necessarily know what we're looking for. We just know um, there's cool stuff out there, and we want to see it. And the open call is a great opportunity for small businesses to present this capability, cyber capability that they have, and say. Um, Here's this thing. Here's some really cool stuff it can do, and we might we might have not even known that that was a problem that we needed to face. So we would have never put it in a problem statement. So it's a really cool opportunity uh, to get access to that kind of technology. They're relatively easy contracts to work with. I know that um, the UAS, the Unmanned Aerial Systems, just did an SBIR uh, pitch day, as they call it, yeah. and I think they awarded some ten contracts in like an hour and a half or something like that. It was, it was a really relatively short period of time between uh, proposal and contract award. And when, in this case, they paid on the spot. So they, uh, uh, like the Air Force pitch day recently, they just used their government purchase cart and paid for the uh, feasibility study right there on the spot. So it says, hey, here's $50,000 for a feasibility study. We're gonna connect you with people we know can use this work together with them and and truly like put out a report that your technology will or won't uh, feasibly solve this problem, you know? And, and so they connect you directly with the users that you want to work with. And then you present them your solution. They tell you whether or not, you know, yeah, this, this is awesome or no, this isn't going to meet our needs. And then from there you can go phase two, which is okay. Build a prototype. Phase three is now you've got a production contract and it's sole source. So we have to go with you because you brought the technology to us. So even if we have a large business, like you mentioned, Booz Allen Hamilton or something, we're going to have to tell Booz Allen to subcontract to you to get that technology, and it's going to be a, a sole source kind of situation. So um, depending on the size. So if it's a really big purchase, that's when we're going to use you as a sub because you probably don't have the DCMA uh, approved accounting systems and stuff like that. So we'll We'll go the other way out, but if it's a, you know, less than two million, then we'll direct contract with you, sole source, uh, to start using that uh, technology in in a production way. So um, it's really cool, and uh, I recommend checking those out. The SBIR program, and if you want more information on those, like I'm definitely going to have uh, some blogs about it on on the Startup Club, and you can check them out. But uh, that's how I'd recommend. If you want to get in the cyber realm, you've got a cool cyber capability. That's where you start. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. And I'm going to check the um, the open calls as well and put some of that word out because people talk about that um, all the time in the small business world about there's two types of uh, – I mean, I'm grouping everybody in two types for a second, but there's the people with kind of what I call O&M type work um, that's always there. And then uh, there's people with the innovation side and um, – it's a little harder for the innovation side. I'm going to, I mean, I'm very familiar with the uh, AppWorks and, and Cibber that you're talking about. So we'll, we'll drive people in that direction. And you're right. I just read about that um, pitch day with the drones. I think it was, it was amazing how fast they were awarded and put out. Um, hey, so we're, we're very good on the time. I did want to, um, and when I say very good, we're almost done. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question about uh, you put out a, looks like you, you and you put out a book, um, out there on the startup club and I can't, and I was trying to find the name of it really quick so I could say it. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Then, uh, uh, tell me so, what's in that book. Great. So we did, we put a, we put out a book. It's uh, 
a little over 100 pages. It's actually free for club members. So you can go to startupclub.org, join, and download the book. Uh, we call it the guidebook on there. But it's also on Amazon for, I think, uh, $4, uh, and, you know, proceeds help support the club. But uh, on, in Amazon, it's called How to Start a, a Business in San Antonio. Um, and, uh, otherwise, you know, I think you might be able to find it, too. It's under the name uh, The Startup Club Guidebook. That's kind of how we always refer to it. It's like our Bible. But, yeah, there's like 12 chapters in there that each, you know, go over from taking your idea to incorporating, to marketing, to, you know, the money side of it, pricing, accounting, all the way through, you know, take, scaling to the world and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a great resource. There's over 48 grants in the book that tells you, okay, you know, if you need funding, these are you know, 48 different ways you can go out and try to get funding. Uh, with links to them, there's, uh, you know, d- different kinds of loan. It just goes over all kinds of things. So I definitely, I recommend, uh, you know, if you want to check that out, it's titled To Start a Business in San Antonio because we do have a lot of uh, how to work the, you know, Texas uh, state uh, regulations and stuff, but the, the yeah. principles in there could be used nationwide. So I definitely want to check that out. Yeah, no, I was flipping through earlier when I was, um, you know, preparing for the podcast and, and a lot of good information. Um, I'll get it. And then I'll also make sure the link's there. Hey, so thanks, Sam. I know I speak for our listeners when I say thank you for joining us today and sharing your tips and knowledge. We'll have your contact information and links where folks can learn more about uh, what you shared today in the show notes. Can you let our listeners know how they can um, learn more about uh, AFSOC or You've already talked a little bit about the Air Force, but if there's, you know, kind of a website or somewhere they might be able to go to related to AFSOC and then separately um, connecting with you as you move on, like I mentioned, you're moving on uh, in August to your next phase. Yeah, so I won't have that government email very long, but uh, if your listeners do want to reach out to me, they can go to the startupclub.org, just hit contact us. I'm the only one that receives those, so uh I'll be, you know, you just send your message and email through there and I will get it and be in touch. That's perfect. Hey, I appreciate it. And then as we wrap up this episode, I wanted to remind all of you listening of a few things. Uh, First, if you find the information valuable and think others would, please share a note about us on LinkedIn or one of the other social media platforms. Definitely give us a thumbs up where you can. Uh, It helps us as we try to spread the word out there. Second, subscribe to our podcast to make sure that you're notified when new episodes like this one are released. I'm your host, Neil McDonnell. I thank you for listening to this episode and hope you'll join us again for other episodes. Remember, government contracting, it's not a secret. It's just a process.